Good morning, friends, and welcome back to Lesson Study 9. Um, it's good to be with you again. <clears throat> we have uh, included uh, two of our three trustee scholars. Unfortunately, our pastor is not with us this morning, but um, we know that he will be with us in prayer and in spirit. Um, so welcome back, um, Brian and Renee. It's good to be back. Thank you, Joe. Good to be with you again and all our viewers and our church family. Thank you both. Um, and a big thank you to all of you who contributed to our study last week. It was definitely, um, to quote Brian, more exciting to watch um, a number of our, our church members and, and other friends contributing to the lesson. So we really appreciate your willingness to be Part, um, to part, be part of our lesson study recording. Um, this week is a little bit different. Um, we have fewer. We have um, invited Dr. Mathil, though, to, be, to join us again. Um, and we'll meet with him a little bit later as we go through the lesson. Um, but this week's lesson was a really meaty one. And it's, um, we realize that it's really difficult for people to be able to comment in 30 seconds or a minute on something of such substance. So, so we've taken a slightly different tactic and we hope that you will enjoy the study that we've prepared as we go through together. Um, <clears throat> and before we start or go to our, our Bible, I'm going to ask Renee to pray for us. Thanks, Renee. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's a privilege to speak about your word, to be involved in this ministry. And I pray that you'll give us the words this morning to speak and that people's hearts will be touched by your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. To those of you who have your, your Bibles nearby, our scripture reading is from Psalm 19 this morning. And just one verse, and what a beautiful verse. In fact, it's a, it's a beautiful both introduction and summary to this week's lesson. And that is Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So keep that in the back of your mind as we navigate our way through this week's lesson. And I'm going to kick off. We had an interesting statement um, it's the heading for Sunday's lesson, A Flat Earth. And um, <clears throat> I thought before we got into that, let's just pause for a moment to recall the theme of our lesson studies this quarter. And that was how to interpret scripture. Um, a title like this can take us down a little bit of a rabbit hole. And um, we wanted to pause before we go down such a rabbit hole. How to interpret scripture and why was that important? The, the verse that was our memory verse a few weeks ago is one that we all know well. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17, where Paul tells us very clearly the reason that we need um, to understand scripture. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And to what end? So that man or, or woman of God can be complete, thoroughly equipped. For every good work and I reflected on that when I looked at the title of Sunday's lesson and I thought sure is a deep study on the theory of the flat earth going to thoroughly equip me for every good work and I wasn't convinced in fact I wanted to share with you a quote from one of Ellen White's early manuscripts where she says the truth does not present ideas mingled with traditions and fables the religion of Jesus Christ presents the truth, pure and undefiled. It will bear investigation, and honest seekers after the truth will have it. And so as I studied that part of the lesson, it brought to mind another question, and that is, how do we know when to read scripture literally, such as in the six-day account of creation in Genesis, and when do we take it figuratively? The lesson uses an example um, from the book of Revelation around the four winds and the four corners of the earth. And I thought this is a lovely example of how do we draw on 
what we've been learning over the last few weeks and apply it to interpret scripture. Two of the principles that we've covered extensively is read a verse in its full context to try to understand it. And secondly, is cross-reference a scripture um, with other portions of the Bible. And we'll find the meaning there. And so I thought, let's apply those two to these two examples to know whether or not we should take something literally or figuratively. So let's apply these principles to the creation account in Genesis. So firstly, the context. And we always, when we're looking at the context, we wanted to know who's writing or who's saying this to whom and why. Well, we know that the author is Moses. We know that he's writing initially for the children of Israel. And a portion, or one of the reasons why is that they understand the facts of their origin as a nation. And we find that confirmed in the book of Luke a little bit later on in the Bible where Luke is running through the genealogy of Jesus and he starts with Jesus, goes all the way back to Abraham, the father of the children of Israel, and then all the way back to Adam and then refers to Adam as the son of God. The other principle that we applied was that of cross-referencing. And Rainier is going to pick up with us a little bit later how the creation story is cross-referenced right through scripture. But I thought I'd just pick up on one of those. And that is a verse that many of us know very well from Exodus 20, where um, God is speaking through Moses and he gives the Ten Commandments. And with the fourth commandment, he says very clearly, to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, for in six days the world was created. Um, so as we, start, as we start applying the principles that we've been studying, we see it helps us to understand that this part, this particular passage, can be taken quite literally. And the other one that's used in the lesson is that from Revelation, where there's reference to the uh, four corners of the earth. And um, again, what is the context? We know that John is writing here, but he's writing, he's describing a vision. And in fact, the description here in Revelation 7, verse 1 and 2, where he speaks about the four winds and the four corners of the earth, is in answer to the question that he closes chapter 6. And chapter 6 asks the question, who's able to stand in that great day of wrath? And so the winds that are about to be released are going to bring wrath. And so the question is simply is, do winds bring wrath? No, they don't. They do bring some devastation possibly, but they don't bring wrath. Do winds live in corners? No, they don't. And so this is not a literal description. Um, if we cross-reference, um, I did a little bit of a search for where else in the Bible do we find this reference to the four corners of the earth. And one in Isaiah, we read about God gathering his people from the four corners of the earth. And the context of that is a prophecy where as punishment, they were going to be scattered across the whole world. And the promise is that they will be brought from all those four corners back to Jerusalem to worship him again. And so we find here this being a figure of speech to explain a wide dispersion. So for me, the lesson, although it started with a strange question, um, it gave us a lovely opportunity to test our learnings from our scholars of the past few lessons as to how do we use these principles to actually understand scripture. So we're going to take that a step further and move across into, um, into Monday's lesson. And Brian, our um, lay historian, um, we poses a as posed with a lovely question here. There are many ancient texts with stories of how the world began. Um, but the archaeological evidence that the biblical account is true is overwhelming. And in fact, the scriptures themselves verify the Genesis account. So it's the same principles applied. Brian, do you want to take us through this? Yes, Daryl. So this is quite an interesting subject, of course, but um, I would like us to focus on the Word of God because there are so many myths that uh, surround the origin of man. And then we have uh, Darwinism uh, and then we have the Big Bang Theory. And uh, the, the, the enemy's design has always been to try and use biblical historical accounts, which are factual and true, 
and, and mix them with uh, pagan culture and uh, mystical religious uh, applications. So we look at uh, the creation account and clearly we see a six day week. Uh, it's a seven day week, but a six days of the seven where God is doing all that needs to be done to bring out a world that is functional, that uh, is fine-tuned for life and existence, for mankind to occupy and to rule. And so we see God could have done it in six hours, but he chose to do it in six days because he had purpose and meaning for what he did. Uh, and when we see the evening, the morning, the first day, even the morning, second day, well, these are just the numbers that God gave of the week. But when it came to the seventh day, he named it himself. Sabbath just means rest. Um, but we see whether it be through calendars, whether it be the Gregorian calendar, Julian calendar, we see that uh, through the Babylonian days of the weeks, they now change to Sunday in honor of the sun and moon day in honor of the moon, which is our Monday, etc., going right down to Jupiter um, and Saturn for Saturday. But God created the world for purpose, as we know. And we find that um, there was this fall that is recorded in Genesis. And the fall is what brought the separation between God's community of perfect communion with his creation, Adam and Eve, of course. So there's a, a very interesting archaeological find that's so recent that it's still been explored today. The thing is this year, whenever there's an archaeological find that confirms biblical accounts, historical places, names, and people, um, you find the media that's controlled, of course, by, you know, secular minds, and uh, they, want not, they don't want this information really out there. And so it's not really given the attention it should. But whenever they find something that has to do with uh, the Big Bang Theory or something that they believe will support, uh, you know, uh, naturalism, anything to do with evolution, I mean, this stuff goes all over on every uh, site and it's on the news and the media. And so that's just the way how the secular uh, mindset works. But um, at a place in Armenia, uh, a place called Zoratskara, it's in Western Armenia, Sisian, uh, a, 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 a hill, it's not a hill, it's actually a mountain, it's 3,300 meters high, was discovered. And um, all credit goes to Dr. Francois Duplessis, uh, whom I've been uh, on several trips with, but I, I wasn't on this trip. Here he shows the discoveries that were made there that point people back to creation week, that point people back to the, the fall, that point people back to a flood, and how the world was repopulated by Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So um, there's uh, some pictures I'd like to show. It shows there on the top of this hill, the mountain is called Utsaha, which actually means mountain of the covenant. So you can imagine here is a gentle slope going down into the valley and on the top of the mountain, a, a, a plateau where um, a large vessel like the ark could have settled. Now, what did they discover there, Daryl? An observatory at the bottom of the hill where they've got 220 stones with round holes in them pointing to the horizon, pointing to different parts of the sky, uh, these people studied uh, astron astronomy and they were able to work out sunset solstices, uh, sunrises, uh, summer, the autumn, um, and they were able to conclude the calendar, language, and the writing. So there's these petroglyphs and there's some pictures of... Uh, uh, the settling of man. So you see uh, images of man there. You see the animals. And you see one that I'd like to point out to uh, a description of a serpent. So you can see the crooked uh, form of it in this uh, writing on stone. Of course, 
That was the writing. It goes back 2500 BC. And it shows uh, a man and a woman. It shows uh, uh, the serpent offering what looks like fruit to the woman. And then she takes it. And then the man, uh, he's got his hands up. What have you done? Anyhow, this depicts the fall. And uh, here are some wonderful artifacts that tell of the flood story. And how could it be only the fact that uh, Noah, when he landed on the top of this mountain, uh, the flood came about in, when he was 600 years old. And the Bible says uh, that Noah lived for 350 years after the flood. So he passes all this knowledge on to his children. And he's, he's received this knowledge pre-flood from his grandfather, from Methuselah, his great-grandfather, from Lamech, his father. And it's quite interesting that Methuselah, the name means in the year that he dies, it shall come, the flood. But um, there are other historical finds, archaeological finds that show that uh, there was once, once a peaceful time when man existed his creator. There was a one language spoken. The discovery of uh, Dr. Samuel Kramer, he finds a clay tablet called the Golden Age of Sumer. It speaks of people speaking one language and a piece of a time when everyone was peaceful and then comes this period. So we find um, archaeology shows that um, the biblical account is true, but uh, sadly it's never ever really given uh, any notice that it should really have. And um, when we just look at God's word, uh, talking about the flat earth, uh, Isaiah speaks of the circle of the earth. Job speaks of God walking above the circle of the heavens. And Psalm 33 verse 9 speaks of God spoke and it was so. So uh, long before people like Copernicus, people like Kepler and other uh, great scientists discovered that the earth was round only in the 17th century, the Bible that was written 1,500 years B.C. revealed that the earth was round and that God, who's the creator, he's the one that brought it into existence. Thank you, Brian. Such, such um, powerful evidence. I know that um, this, is the, this is one of those areas, the more you study, the more you want to study. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And it leads us beautifully into, into the study of the next part of our lesson, which is taking us to Tuesday's lesson. And Tuesday lesson builds on, on a little of what Brian is, is saying here. There, there, when we look at some of the other pagan myths around the origin of the world and um, the origin of man, there, there are interesting um, similarities in stories, but there are some very clear distinctions between the biblical accounts and, and all of those others. And there, there's two that we wanted to unpack together here with Brian and Rene. Um, and the first one on Tuesday's lesson is, it makes reference to the greater light and the lesser light that were created on the fourth day. Um, Brian, you wanted to expand on this one a little bit. Well, as we see on the fourth day of the week, uh, God um, ordained that the sun would rule the day and the moon would rule the night. And they were put in the uh, orbit, finely worked out in their orbits to bring about our days, our, of course, the earth revolving on its axis, um, the month through the moon cycles, and then the year through the earth uh, uh, around the sun. So uh, again, on this place here at uh, Uchatsa, we find that this observatory, they recognize that the, the world revolved around the sun and that it was uh, the, um, the days, the months, and even our seasons that were worked out this now, it's interesting, Genesis, Daryl, we find in Genesis uh, chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, when, when Noah um, had landed um, on the earth, we find that um, it gives the date. So it gives um, the seventh day when he sent out the dove, the day uh, of the week. So we have a weekly cycle, which comes from creation. And then it gives the month and it gives the year. So way back then, already God had given to man how to understand what was the weekly cycle through the creation week and the Sabbath. What was the day, uh, dark part, light part, 
and what were the months, the moon, uh, the lunar cycles, and what was the year. Um, of course, the Babylonians understood this, the Egyptians and their um, Ararataic and Syriac writings that confirm these things. But it all goes back to creation. And so when you look at the, the sun and the moon, God says, this is how the, the, the weekly, the monthly, the annual cycles would be. And we only have the week because of creation. Thanks, Brian. Um, another, another highlight that comes out of Tuesday's lesson is the reference in, in Genesis chapter 2 around, about the intimate way in which God created Adam and Eve. And Rainier, you wanted to give us some, some deeper understanding on this principle. So when you look at Revelation 4, 11, the Bible says that you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your power they exist. So God is worthy of our worship and adoration because he's our creator, he's our father. But it's not like any other pagan God that is this distant God, but he's an intimate God. He is a God that came into creation physically got involved in the creation of man, breathed into his nostrils, and then doing some surgery to obviously create Eve. So God is intimately involved, and he is really trying desperately to show us how intimately involved he wants to be in our lives. Some believe he's this distant God that's far away, but yet he dedicates a whole book, the Song of Solomon, to show the intimacy between a husband and a wife to show how intimate he wants to be with us. I mean, if you carefully study Song of Solomon and you decipher the symbolic language that, or the, the allegories or the, the parables that Solomon uses to explain this relationship between him and his wife, you would actually not have children in the audience when you explain it. That's how intimate and graphic it is. So if God gives a, dedicates a whole book to that intimate relationship and then saying that we are his bride and he's our husband, especially Christ, then it shows us how intimate he wants to be with us. I mean, any married person watching here today would know how intimate intimacy is. So God wants to be that intimate with us. On the Sabbath, a special day, 24 hours set aside where he wants to be intimate with us. In the mornings when we wake up, spending time with the living God and talking to him and reading his word, discovering his character, and then living out his character through his power, all of this shows the intimacy of this God that makes him different from the pagan gods. He's totally different. He's not a far off. He sticks closer than the fr than a friend, the Bible says. So God is really an intimate God. And I'm excited about it when I, I look at marriage and I see how intimate God wants to be. Thank you, Reni. What a beautiful image um, you've painted there for us. Um, this, is, uh, this is not just about the mechanics of creation. This is about the hearts of God poured into creation. So thank you for that. Um, and that brings us to, to Wednesday's part of the lesson, which um, poses a, a couple of interesting questions. And um, the title for Wednesday's lesson is Creation in Time. And um, in the study itself, it shows us how the genealogies of the Bible, they refer to them as prono genealogies, can match with history. But we, we asked and uh, posed a slightly different question to Dr. Michiel Smith, and we've invited him to record a, an insert here. And that is around how does... Um, does nature support this biblical timeline for Earth? So aside from the history books supporting it through the genealogies, through the lifespans of, of the men through the Bible, is to what extent does nature support a biblical timeline for life on Earth? Um, Dr. Michiel, over to you. Nature and history indeed support the biblical timeline for life on Earth. I'm so glad the Bible is so concise and accurate that makes it so much easier to refute the devil's deceptions with confidence and faith in the things we do not know. Genesis 5 and 11 is remarkable and enable us to calculate the time from creation to Abram accurately. It is significant to note that 10 of Abram's post-flood ancestors 
were still alive during his early uh, life, including Noah. I cannot trace my genealogy for more than four generations, and yet the genealogy of Jesus Christ is written up in the book of Matthew and Luke, in Luke via the lineage of Maria all the way to Adam, the Son of God. The life of Jesus Christ was so real and significant that our calendar, even here in South Africa, counts the year since Christ. We now live in the year 2020 after Jesus Christ. How can anybody stand indifferent to that fact and tell me Jesus was not a real person? If you Google what is the oldest living thing on earth, Google comes up with this picture of the bristlecone pine. I find it significant that the age for the oldest tree on earth approximate the time since the biblical worldwide flood. The difficult to determine the date for the first written record on soybeans made me appreciate the biblical accuracy and wisdom that much more. Emperor Sheng Ying did not date his books, but the one who inspired the author of Genesis understood the importance and did date stamp the creation week in an ingenious way. Ancient Chinese used pictographs to develop a written language which was based on their common knowledge of the Genesis story. Here is five examples. See how the word boat in the left upper is made up of a vessel with eight mouths in. Obviously, Noah, his wife, three sons and their wives. Also note the bottom one, uh, left, uh, right, flood, eight, united, earth equals total plus water equals flood. The world population now stands at 7.6 billion. I remember uh, when it was 3 billion something in 1973. The world population has doubled in my lifetime. In the time of Christ, it was only 200 million. And if we extrapolate back in time, the line runs to zero even before we get to 4000 BC. The biblical account is correct. The fossil bearing portion of the geological record can be found in water deposited sedimentary layers of which about 1,372 meters are exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon in the USA. What speaks very loudly to us when looking at these layers in, for instance, the picture given here, is the fact that the sedimentary layers have sharp lines indicating no weathering before the next layer was deposited, just as what you would expect from a worldwide flood such as recorded in Genesis. I assisted in a bamboo to energy project next to the Tugela River and was responsible for developing a crop irrigation routine. We measured the salt content and was alarmed by the amount of water suspended soil the Tugela carries out to ocean. If this kind of erosion has been going for time duration allowed for in the evolutionary theory, South Africa would have been washed out into the sea long ago already. Once again, the data supports a recent creation narrative. Genetic deterioration for all life on earth started when sin entered the world as recorded in Genesis. The trend of genetic weathering can be calculated and modeled mathematically. In this graph you see the mathematical prediction for 180,000 years in red, uh, which is the evolutionary timeline for humans on Earth, uh, for a, a random 10,000 years in blue, and then the current actual mutation uh, recorded. 
from the actual in green, it is clear that the number of years of DNA weathering must be less than 10,000 years. The Bible truly is an authority on life on this planet. The more unbiased scientific research is undertaken, the more that fact is validated. Thank you so much, Michiel. And this brings us to Thursday's lesson, which is such a beautiful culmination of, of this, week's, um, this week's study. The, the way that creation is referenced throughout the scriptures definitely implies an intelligent design. And Rainier has built a beautiful summary coming through Wednesday's lesson that culminates in this concept. So Rainier, take us through that. So when we look at creation in time, we look at um, ancient literature, what paganism has said, etc. There are much evidence outside of scripture that points to the fact that God created literal six days and the rest of it on the seventh. And in the Bible, we've got many references in the New Testament of how different writers point to that creation in the beginning. But I want to go on to a different path, a path where when we look at the earth itself and the creation that God has put there, we can see intelligent design that confirms this literal six-day creation and that we can look at it and say, you know, if this is su such an amazing creation, we can go to Genesis and actually believe what is written. Because Isaac Newton said the following. He said, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And I want to share with you guys today the anthropic principle. This anthropic principle is the mounting evidence that has many scientists believing that the universe is extremely fine-tuned or designed to support life here on Earth. So when scientists are looking at nature, they're looking at everything that, that is ex in existence, they think to themselves, man, this must be an intelligent design. And many an atheist is struggling with this, pro this principle of the anthropic principle. I want to share a couple of points with you guys this morning. When we look at the oxygen levels on the earth, the atmosphere comprises 21% of the atmosphere, of, of oxygen, sorry, the oxygen comprises 21% of the atmosphere. If it were 25%, then fires would erupt spontaneously. If it were 15%, then humans would suffocate. You see how perfect that is? When we look at the moon and the earth gravitational interaction, if the interaction was greater than it currently is, then there would be tidal waves and the oceans would be totally out of sorts. If it were less, then orbital changes would cause climatic instabilities. So the gravitational pull between the Earth and the Moon is just perfect. When you look at carbon dioxide levels, if the CO2 level were higher than it is now, then runaway greenhouse effects would develop, meaning we would have, we'll all burn up. If the level was lower than it currently is, then we will all suffocate because plants will not be able to maintain the effect of photosynthesis. So once again, it is just perfect. When we look at gravity, if the gravitational force were altered by, now listen to this, by zero point, then count 37 zeros, and then add a one at the end, percent. So 0 0.37 zeros, one percent. If the gravitational force just was altered by that percentage, the sun would not exist, and therefore neither would we. This is how perfectly God has uh, created this universe and this earth. Now, the beauty of this all is that there are more than a hundred of these narrowly defined constants that strongly point to an intelligent designer. I've only shared four with you. I want to end off with another two. If Jupiter was not in its current orbit, the Earth would be bombarded by meteors, space material. The reason is Jupiter's gravitational field acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, and it attracts asteroids and comets to it, which otherwise would have struck the Earth. It's just amazing how God puts a vacuum cleaner 
in the universe to protect us here on the earth. The last one I want to share is that the axle tilt of the earth, the round earth of 23 degrees is just right. If it tilted slightly, then the surface temperatures of the earth would be extremely high and obviously would, won't be able to exist on the earth. So all of this just points to an intelligent designer. As I said, there are more than 100. And this, is, this anthropic principle has really um, baffled many non-religious scientists. But this is just proof that this, this earth that we are living in, there's an intelligent designer. And we can trust the word of God when it says, God created in six literal days. Wow, Rennie, thank you so very much. Um, and uh, I recall from my own um, studies at university a lifetime ago, um, and although my professors carried a very strong evolutionary bent in my zoology and physiology studies, to me, all it did was actually confirm my faith. Mm. Um, the intricacies of different species, the relationships between different species. Um, I came out of class after class after class having my faith in intelligent design reaffirmed over and over, despite many a professor attempting to convince us otherwise. So thank you for, for reminding us of that. And it's very easy for us to just take a walk around and, and take for granted the the balance that there is in the world around us um and forget about what it takes to actually hold all that together and perhaps that's a fitting way for us to to conclude our, our lesson and and as we wrap up this morning i'm going to just invite both of you to just make a a closing comment on how this particular study has yet again reaffirmed your faith before we close. Brian, a closing comment from you. So Daryl, as, as I looked at the uh, historical setting of the creation account, uh, it gives me confidence and uh, an awe for my creator God, who carefully thought about me and how I could live in a world and be in harmony with him, his law, and his love. Mm -hmm. And so we see, of course, the fall of man, how that disrupted God's plan. And because of sin, he had to destroy the entire earth, the flood. But we find through the flood, through Noah, who had faith in God. It says, Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, and he obeyed all the Lord he, uh, commanded him. And through his three sons, we find the earth is repopulated. He passes on all the information to them because he lives 350 years afterwards. They settle in different regions of the world. The Kushites bring about the apostasy. They build the Tower of Babel. And of course, they mix it with things that are creative. So the devil always wants to try and wrap error and myth with God's truth to try and bring confusion and discredit God's word and his love for humanity. But I saw in all this year, God's love is covenant with Noah, with his posterity to repopulate the earth. And we see through the line of Shem, Christ comes onto this earth and he brings back that harmony, that connection, that restoration that God wants for everyone, which will culminate in the second coming of Christ. So there's a beautiful thread right from Genesis right through to Revelation and the remnant and the God who wants to dwell with his people, which will happen at the end of time. Thank you, Brian. Rene, your closing I think thoughts. For me, I think for me, what I've really appreciated is Brian's thoughts on how, you know, these ancient people, God has not left them in darkness. While they were studying and just using the simplest methods to study the stars, etc., God has come and revealed himself in such a way that they actually have the writings of Genesis, like Adam and Eve, in their writings, showing that God, from that intimately wanting to be involved, 
it's like God is showing to the ancient people, I love you, I care for you, I am real, I do exist. Paganism has tried to come and distort this picture of God, but then he overrides it once again with the beauty of what he has created in creation. And all of this points to one thing. The God who created is the God who died and wants to recreate us and have an intimate relationship with us. Don't push him away. Don't believe the devil's lies that he's afar off, but he is a God close to us and wants to do amazing things in us and through us. Amen. And that's such a powerful conclusion because after all, from Genesis to Revelation, it is a love story. It is Mm -hmm. the love of the creator God for every single one of his created beings. Um, Mm -hmm. And that perhaps is the fitting place for us to close off this week's study and to encourage our viewers to to acknowledge that love, um, accept it into their lives, accept it into your life, and to build that deep heart connection with the God who created you and the God who saves you um, and wants to spend eternity with you. Let's close on that on that note. And Brian, can I ask you to close in prayer for us, please? Sure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace, for your love that is so deep, so high, so wide. We can never exhaust the fathomless, infinite love that you have for us. And even though sin destroyed the original image and has marred and separated the relationship that you had in the very beginning with your creation, with your children. We thank you that right there you promised that you would intervene and that Jesus, who came to show us the love of God and demonstrated it and gave himself for us, is the same Jesus that ever lives to intercede for us, who's gone to prepare a place for us, who is coming soon for all those who love is appearing. May the study of thy word give us a faith in you like never before and an abiding trust and love so that when you come in the clouds of glory, we might be ready to spend eternity with you and all of the saved, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you both very much. Um, And we... Uh, invite our viewers to again interact, comment um, and let us know if you would like to be involved in another recording Um, we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, all the viewers.